you know, the, the day before I was on a beach in Brazil at a 300,000 person party during COVID. I nice. flew home. My friend picked me up from the airport, said we're going to DC. The, the honest truth is I had, I had really no idea the details. I'm on the front steps there. My girl who is English, she lives in London. She's like, yo, you're on the CNN. Tool Shed Art Club. I, I just like yelling that at the beginning. That's all right. Hey, so Tool Shed Art Club, we've got myself, Matt Bechtel, Austin Anderson, and of course, the boogeyman, the boogerman, Yavid, David Gunn from King 810. And you know what? I've been needing to say this for a while, too, because we're putting out Wait, this. Can content. I say something real quick? I like I need multiple names. Oh. So when I went on the radio the other day because of my mustache, yeah. they were calling me Austin the Law Anderson. So that's a possibility. <laughs> but I like how, you know, you've uh david over here he has you know multiple names oh yeah and i've i feel like you know sorry I'll, we'll names. only oh, call yeah. you the law from no now i mean like I, it's got to be multiple <laughs> austin the law anderson austin anderson <laughs> uh i gotta say this you know we've been putting out this content and i was thinking about it i need you the listener to know that we have a gentleman's agreement that you listen to this i need you to give us five stars on spotify i need us i need five stars on apple music we need subscribers on youtube we need followers on instagram tool shed art club everything we're tool shed art club you find us everywhere because here's the deal now that you guys know that if you guys don't do this i'm gonna have the boogeyman come and snatch up your shoes david do you think that that's reasonable yeah discuss it because this is being recorded <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. All right. Well, today we're going to talk about uh, disaster capitalism. In our episode about ancient Rome, David said Henry Kissinger is going down. And so that's part of what we're going to roll with today. So, uh, David, you had some interesting insights on Kissinger. Austin, this is something that I know you have a lot of thoughts on. I don't have as many on him per se, but I was going to leave it to you two to kind of get the conversation rolling. So, uh, David, how has Henry Kissinger negatively impacted the world or the United States of America? I always feel like a shill commenting on these things because I'm the singer of a rock band, right? So what do I have to say about someone like Kissinger? Uh, aside from it feels like kind of picking on one person, but he didn't really invent the wheel on this. But it's a it's a decent place to start. And I became interested in this through music, actually, superficially. I remember when I was a kid, I don't know if you have the same experience, but the bands that I liked kind of talked about these things that he was involved in and many other people were involved in. We're not just picking on Kissinger, but when you're 13 and you know, you're a rocker in training and you, you're you you're playing your first gigs. It's the late 90s, early 2000s, and you're listening to Rage and you're really into it and you're walking around thinking you're cool. And, and then you hear, you know, Coca-Cola's back in the veins of Saigon. And you're like, what the hell does that mean? You know, because you yeah. don't know who Saigon is. Then you go to the library because it's another free place that kids that are poor hang out. And you start reading. And again, you're young, you're pretty dumb. And you come across Nixon and Kissinger unleashing the madman theory, which means carpet bombing Cambodian children, killing hundreds of thousands of civilians, because that's what you do when you have a, an operation called man, ma madman theory. And the carpet bomb was a bit more than a theory, at least to the Cambodians. It, it was a, a fact. And you might think, well, carpet bomb, you know, that was the 70s, but that's old news. You know, my guy Biden would never do that. But in 2023, we just sent a bunch of cluster bombs over to the Ukraine, which also makes us war criminals because those are illegal. They but, probably told that old man that they were dropping off like, uh, you know, packages of food. They're <laughs> like, we're going to we're going to drop off some uh, 
some gift packages. <laughs> and he's like, oh, that sounds great. Oh, hey, uh, I'm old as shit. There's two. Th well, actually, I have three things to say. One, I heard an AI thing of Joe Biden, and I actually knew it was AI because he wasn't like messing up his speech. That said Two, Henry Kissinger is still alive, so he's free to make fun of. However, as Lemmy, as Lemmy Kilmeister said, just because you're dead doesn't mean you're not an asshole. Now you're just a dead asshole. So I still follow that. And th and three, um, yeah, when it came to those cluster bombs, they had asked, I believe, Jen Psaki a few months ago uh, or when she was in, you know, about Russia doing it. And she said, if Russia uses cluster bombs, we will consider that a war crime. And yet here we are having a conversation with Zelensky that um, we may provide them with a uh, cluster bomb. So uh, America's foreign policy is uh, again, undefeated. But, okay. Yeah. I gotta, can I digress for just a minute? Cause I want to ask David this being, um, you know, I'm a comedian, you're, you're um, a musician. Like what, what do you think about the fact that a comedian is running Ukraine? Uh, it's, it's who we wanted in there. And we, we often have these corporate sponsored coups and these, yeah. you know, um, we'll, we'll probably get into that stuff. Um, but there's a reason why he's there and he's, it's sad because a lot of people are dying because of our corporate interests. And I, I think we'll, we'll probably get into that. That dude probably would come off stage and just loved hearing like you killed it, man. And then he was like, I'm gonna kill people for real. <laughs> well, what was what was your take? I mean, how how do you feel knowing that there's a commit? Do you think that it's weird? Yeah, I think it's bizarre, man. Like just knowing how comedians are wired, knowing so many like myself and so many other comedians, like I just it it baffles the mind that and I don't know how successful he was over there, if he was like a Yakov Shmirnov or something, but um that someone like with uh a brain wired like a comedian would run a country and then like go to war. You know what I mean? Like, it, I don't know. It's just, it's interesting. I, yeah, I just, can't I was it. thinking the same thing, um, not to, to digress, but I had these same thoughts when I was uh, not to be funny, but a teenager, um, when I would investigate the books that some of these people said to read or some of the artists that I followed, um, I'm walking around, for example, you know, being a musician, you're diving into all this stuff. You're listening to music, uh, playing music, you know, 20 hours a day, you're walking around the hood and you're listening to say something like system of a down or something like that. And then you hear something like drug money is used to rig elections and train brutal corporate sponsored dictators around the world. <laughs> yeah. You, you stop for a second. <laughs> you know, because you're in the streets of Flint, you're watching drug deals happen. Yeah. And you're and you're hearing this stuff and your antennas are going up and you, you say it's used to rig elections and train. What is this guy talking about? So yeah. then you go back to the library. You start checking books, and then you get, you know, 1953, the CIA plot to overthrow Iran and install the Shah. You asked about Zelensky. 1954, the CIA sponsored coup in Guatemala. Argentina in the 70s, 30,000 leftist junta activists disappear. The sponsor of the Pinochet leadership to privatize Chile. In 1989 in China, the Tiananmen Square massacre, the arrest of tens of thousands of their own people to prevent democracy from taking place. Russia in 1993 under Yeltsin sent tank to his own parliament to set fire to the parliament building and lock up his political opponents. Rolled out the privatization that produced all the oligarchs we're still predicting today. Latin America, the debt crisis, Uruguay, Brazil, Mexico. So when you ask about Zelensky being the leader, if you have a little context, yeah, it makes it, who else but a comedian? You, yeah, you know what, uh, like while you were saying all that, kind of something that just popped in my mind, and I know it's it, it might sound like far-fetched or outlandish, but... I mean, it's a complete possibility that Hunter Biden's over there. He's on a tear on a bender, goes to a comedy club, meets Zelensky. <laughs> they party hard. They're doing rails a blow off of uh, strippers for sure. Yeah. And then Hunter's like, dude, we can make you we can make you the, the like the, the leader, man. We can make you. And then he, and Zelensky's like, yeah, that'd be dope. 
and then then they did. Well, there was like a like, video. I could actually see that something that stupid playing out or that simple. Oh, just because you know how politicians and celebrities behave on their own and with each other. Yeah. And I was going to say, too, there like Zelensky was on. I, he, I think he was in movies, but he was on TV and stuff like there was a bit. And ironically, Putin may have been in the audience, but he did this thing where he was like playing the piano with his penis. It was a joke, like some Saturday Night Live type skit over there. He's running the country. That was what I was talking about. Comedians brains are wired different. Yeah. You have a guy running a country where you can watch him playing a piano with his penis. Yeah, I uh, may. I'm not going to pull it. I'm not going to pull it. Well, I want to see. I'm just curious if Putin was in the audience. But anyway, it's like, yeah, of course. And honestly, that Hunter Biden and him doing coke theory. I've never heard anybody say something like that before in my mind, but I'm thinking about it and I'm like that there's not a 0% chance that right. that didn't happen. Right. Well, listen, in your theory, your Zelensky Biden theory, I uh, didn't kill hundreds of thousands of Cambodians like the madman theory did. So yeah. I th think yours is a, is a technically safer bet. No yeah. pun intended yeah. to appeal to the comedian. Bowen. Yeah, so let's, David, uh, yeah, take us into just that madman theory and kind of uh, bring us up to speed on it, because to be honest, I have I haven't heard of it. Well, this was a this was a posturing by the man they ironically call Tricky Dick <laughs> Nixon. And it was him and him and Kissinger's plan to go into Cambodia, massacre a, a couple hundred thousand Cambodians, basically to spook them. This was during Vietnam. So we said the same things we always say, uh, that they're, they have strongholds and they're using Cambodia and they're harboring and all these other things. But I also had an, a note written down here as a disclaimer. We have to, for every bad conversation, uh, bad for the spirit, like this one will be economically, politically, whatever topic, we have to talk about something that's good for the spirit because these topics are depressing and I kind of spiral and they suck your soul. Yeah, because and you feel powerless, like you would like to see change or change something, but like we're just plebs. Yeah, that's a good yeah. point. Do you so have I'm, an idea of something more uplifting that we should roll to next week? <laughs> I'm just keep that in the back of your mind that, you know, we need to do something. Yeah. 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 I'll, I'll get, I got, I'll come and up with then that I'll continue idea. to steamroll. Yeah. <laughs> I've found, and I'm sure you two have too, David, that all these uh, powerful people, like the people that were in the Clinton campaign are like, they're art collectors, but their art that they collect is super, super. Disturbing. John Podesta. Kissinger, like, what is his hobby? Like, is he like, what does he collect? Yeah. And then why we go on with that? Maybe that will be Kissinger one way we hobby. Uh, yeah. make this a it little was actually funny. I believe he was asked by the government uh, who found that he had a, a gross conflict of interests globally to disclose some of his clients in his business, which is one of these kind of vaguely named Kissinger and Associates, whatever, what is it exactly you do, you know, because you you're in government, you have this business, who are your Their clients? slogan is we take lives. He quit. He, he, he stepped down uh, before revealing his client list. He was interesting. And so I'm just diving back in. I, I feel like at this point in my life, I'm again, I'm a teenager. I can't even vote. So I have no political agenda, but nothing Nothing has changed since then. I, I still don't because it's a horrible, horrible place. But yeah, I don't vote either. And I get people give me a hard time. They're like, this is your American ride. And I'm like, yeah, my American ride. I can choose to, you know, for some reason, that's like yeah. not one of my American rights. Like I have to pick like just one of our only two options. I go, no, I have a choice, right? I think that is the light at the end of the tunnel when we have these types of conversations, because maybe you will come to some sort of enlightened, not in a spiritual sense, but just open in the mind. It might open to other people's minds. It might get someone thinking differently, you know, because when I was a kid around this age, actually, I, I think I wrote it in my book. I, I found this book called Lies My Teacher Told Me. And then I realized, and a lot of this 
stuff we're being told, it doesn't necessarily have to be true. And that sounds funny now in the world that we live in today, because you can just pull your phone out and fact check anyone. But you know, when you're growing up in school and you're in middle school and, and you, you realize that your teacher could very well not really be telling you the real story, it kind of changes the way that you look at things. Right. Like, I actually had a funny thought I was thinking of this morning when I was thinking of this, and this would be more along the lines for Austin because I try to appeal to his comedic nature. This is kind of a bit. And um, I was thinking, growing up in the streets, if someone smoked someone, you know, they had a body, right? That's how you get respect. You kill someone. So yeah. you'd be talking with your friends when you're a kid and, the, you know, older kids. You're like, is that Christian over there? Yeah, that's Christian. Yo, he got two bodies, man. You don't want to mess with that dude, right? He's killed two people, you know, and that's not very Christian of him. But, you know, he's got these two bodies. I always wonder if that's how the politicians move. Like if Kissinger yeah. comes in looking like a straight goblin demon, right? <laughs> Yeah, and dude. the politicians are in the corner like, hey, shh. <laughs> Bodies on that motherfucker. Yeah, right? that's and a great Bill premise Clinton for a and... joke. Exactly. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I got some shows this weekend. I'm going to, I might mess with that. I'll let yeah. you know how it goes because that is so true. Like He's opening for yeah. Landau on Friday, David. He's, so you oh, may have. Cool. He's, yeah, he's lit fire to Vietnam, man. He's exactly. So, so Yeah, then, that's interesting. And then you have Bill Clinton walks in, right? And, <laughs> and they're like, keep it down. It's, it's Clinton. You know, that's Clinton. That's half a mil, half a mil. And they're like, half a million dollars? And they're like, no, 500,000 Iraqi kids. He's yeah. cold. He's killed half a mil. And Not the ones that kill for fun here in the States, allegedly. Exactly. I always wondered if, if they do the same type of, they have the same type of culture, you know, in that way. Yeah. But, I know I know how we're going to tie all this together. First of all, I discovered that Kissinger is a big fan of soccer. Um, how we can tie all this together is how um, this influenced the music of the 90s with System of a Down, Rage Against the Machine, Marilyn Manson, because they would kind of take it all out on capitalism. And I think I, I did an interview on Book Brilliant with Scott Horton, one of the leading libertarian thinkers. And as he says, what they needed all the way back in Vietnam was the anti-war guys they kind of leaned left or whatever but what they needed was somebody who was who could say hey i'm conservative i believe in lower taxes and yada 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 um i don't, i'm not for this war and here's why because that's a better conversation and so when you would hear like you know marilyn manson like capitalism has made it this way and it's like well i don't think that this is directly due to capitalism um you know per se i don't think that they're one and the same i don't think that communists are going to be even more peaceful if anything i guess they just unleash that well, violence like onto like their own people communism as like consolidated capitalism where <laughs> like the the you know because i always think of corporations as their own little countries and they're always going to war with each other and trying to you know fighting each other for uh resources and all that so with then in like a communist world it's like all the top corporations have you know they've reached the top of the mountain and destroyed all the rest. Well, and I'll say I'll, I can kind of set up the backdrop too for the nineties. I'm going to sum up the middle Eastern conflict and let's see if I can do it in about a minute or two. So um, what rage against the machine? I, I don't even know if rage against the machine machine was singing as much about, um, you know, the middle East per se as maybe some of the others um, and system of a down that I forget they were, what was there? What was system of a down? Mostly singing about it was uh, they were singing about chop suey. Uh, <laughs> David, what was uh, Armenian? They were more of the Armenian genocide, right? That's kind of yeah. what they were talking about. So, you know, keep in mind. So when they're writing about this stuff in the 90s, where this is coming from is. So first of all, we have in the 80s. Uh, so 70s, 80s, we've got Carter. He is supporting Iraq or he's supporting the Afghanis, the Afghanis who are trying to fend off the Soviet Union. You have uh, under Reagan and Bush, uh, you support Saddam Hussein for eight years in his war with Iran. And then in Iraq, um, he goes into Kuwait and we use that as a premise to for the Iraq war one, because we had bases in the Soviet Union that we were saying that we were trying to protect because we had set up an, a no fly zone and, and Saddam's invasion to Kuwait was essentially because of unpaid war debts and some oil stuff. Right. So we go into Iraq 
maybe halfway through this, uh, George Bush essentially gasses up the Kurds. And by that, I mean, he tells them that we support them. We've got their back. Let's see this all the way through and let's overthrow Saddam. He thinks about the fact that he just supported Saddam for eight years, changes his mind, pulls out. Saddam kills a lot of the Kurdish, um, which people, uh, they may or may not believe that he would have continued to do so. There's a theory maybe that he, he would have stopped because the war was over. Um, but so we have that. In the meantime, what a lot of people forget about is that Bill Clinton was bombing the shit out of people left and right while the Mujahideen that he would somewhat support um, in places like um, I'm thinking Czechoslovakia, but that's not it. Um, I'm blanking on on uh, where it was at, but where he would support the Mujahideen and some of their stuff. But the Mujahideen were also trying to blow up the trade centers and were committing terrorist attacks against the United States. So um, they couldn't believe that the that, um, you know, Osama and those guys were pissed off at them because they thought, well, wow, we've done a lot for these guys. So when Mogadishu happened, Black Hawk down, uh, what Saddam Hussein was hoping to accomplish there was he wanted to get the United States involved in a war of attrition, similar to what they did with Soviet with the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, which you could parallel and say that that was part of what made the Soviet Union collapse. Osama wanted to do the same thing to America in Mogadishu. It didn't work out. When the Twin Towers happened, Osama bin Laden didn't expect us to go full charge into Afghanistan and stay there. That's um, from what I know, he didn't expect that. And that's not necessarily what he wanted either. He thought that he could, you know, keep weakening our economy and destroying us over time. So that's kind of the backdrop of uh, the nineties music that David maybe grew up listening to. Do do you guys feel like that's a fair summary? Damn. (laughs) David. I think that was, that was pretty good. I, um, it's it's really hard as you get older to to kind of put it together, you know, because you're just a jackass playing rock and roll and you think it's the music of the revolt and it's lowbrow and it's against the grain and it's contrary. And, you know, but um, I just quoted Rage, who I love, but Tom Morello went to Harvard. They sold over 10 million records. They sell T-shirts of Che Guevara at Hot Topic, who is a Cuban Hitler known for having. Yeah, I was thought I was thought that was bizarre. Stalin disliked blacks prophets of rage played the democratic national convention so what machine are you exactly raging against i don't really know but and they charge like six hundred dollars a ticket yeah so so it it creates more confusion but it's very hard to to understand all of these things because you just did a, a pretty good job of summing it up but i don't believe the argument is for capitalism or socialism like you just said it's it's more if you look at what's happening right now, try to remember what they happened, what they did during all that time that you just described. They they put out an issue everyone could rally around. It was weapons of mass destruction. Oh, yeah. They they get a bunch of smaller issues like they're doing today. Terrorism was hiding in the Middle East. You remember that? The 9-11 hijackers were Saudis. Iran was funding Hezbollah. Syria was housing Hamas leaders. Iraq's funding Palestinian suicide bombers. And Bush's quote was, we have to go spread freedom and democracy to these poor people. And the after answer, we blow them up. Yeah, well, that's the, the means. that's the means that's to justify the ends. And it's a great hustle. And that's where the disaster capitalism comes in. You know, it's they got thirty eight billion dollars from Congress to go save the world. And what I mean by that is Congress is not a private business, as we all know. That was our money. And they also yeah. use the Iraqi taxpayers' money to pay for their own destruction. That's what they do. The UN creates all these sanctions, like we just opened up talking about, that kneecap and limit a country's military capabilities. Then we invade it for an easy war. If you recall that, that's what we did in the Middle East. Uh, generals were quoted saying, us compared to Iraq is like our PlayStations compared to their Ataris. And doesn't that sound very familiar? Because we're hearing that today as well. Don't we hear every time enthusiasm for the war in the Ukraine that Putin's forces are weakening and on the edge of defeat? And it's it's now coming up on two years, by the way. But just remember, try to have a perspective that we didn't win in the Middle East. A bunch of rich people got richer, but after 20 years, we were screaming no more forever wars and we had to have had to leave without victory because we define victory as 
building a free country, liberated and oppressed people, you know? Yeah, it should. In 20 years, it should be a place that uh, anyone would feel comfortable to go on vacation to. Yeah. And two things real quick. The, it was the Mujahideen in Chechnya. I, I kept thinking Czech and that wasn't it was Chechnya is what I was talking about. And also a lot of these instigators and all of these conflicts were our involvement or support of politics overseas. And I think politics is a very like it blows my mind that you can vote on something you know nothing about. I don't I can't go into a business and tell them how to run it if I don't know anything about the business. Right. And sometimes it's like that with foreign policy, I feel like. And I'll, I'll speak to this as someone being on city council. When stuff happens in my city, I know it because I was in it and I knew the behind the scenes and I knew all of the characters at work. And so when an outsider, we would have people come in from Omaha saying like, I'm here from Omaha to tell you guys how it is. And it's like, you don't even know you're not here. And sometimes people have good intentions. And I feel like there's probably a lot of characters in America's foreign policy that had great intentions, but you don't live there. You don't know. And even if you were to live in a little, uh, I forget what you call it, the UN, uh, wh where, you know, where their base is or whatever, you know, it's like, yeah, where but is their base? Well, no, Which I'm talking, I'm talking about like all Halliburton well, suburbs that they built over there with our money. Yeah. I'm just talking about like, uh, you know, where we have, uh, where we have, um, like our, our, our sites where people stay from, from the United States as ambassadors. Oh, where the, and, the, yeah. Embassy was the word I was looking for the word I was looking for was embassy, you know? Okay, cool. You lived at the embassy still, but you're not from there. You're not living there. And so I don't know if I'll necessarily take the approach of don't do anything. I just think that we've done a lot of misguided things. And I think, um, you know, I, I ran has uh, taken a lot of kicks in the nuts from us and what freaks me out. Um, I would be, I'm definitely suspicious of China, but I'm also suspicious of how there's a lot of war rallying of like, yeah, China's our biggest enemy. And anytime I'm here and it starts to, it's, it's getting to the point now where I'm starting to be like, uh, hold, hold on, <laughs> you know, what's, what's going on here? This is starting to get a little spooky. I don't think we need to get involved in the giant world war with Russia or China. You know what I mean? It's like, we don't yeah. even know all of the facts. Look at all like the. Dude, they would the Chinese would just come over here with harpoons and just harpoon just all of our fatties that live here that that just eat nothing but high fructose corn syrup. Back in the day when Japan said there'd be a, a an American with a gun behind every blade of grass, now they're like, there's a 300 pound American behind every blade yeah. of grass. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I am not in love with China by by any stretch of the imagination. But who has China invaded recently? They, I don't even think they haven't even really no. invaded uh, Taiwan. Yeah. They just kind of set up a, a lockdown over it. But I think it's because they have patience. You know, if you can cut bonsais, or is that the Japanese? Mm -hmm. Well, the the the, the Jap China China has a hundred year plan supposedly, or a five hundred yeah. year plan, right? I mean, they're playing they're playing the long game. So what I what I think the the conversation I think how what I think is an interesting thing to me is. Um, how this stuff in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, um, how it has influenced art and to what level do, do we want to hear from a musician in his 20s talk about how the world should be ran, right? Our, 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 uh, I don't know. It was, it was so weird for me, like just growing up. I mean, I grew up in the 90s, you know, that's, that's when I came to age. And I remember Rage Against the Machine. You know, and they, I mean, they hit hard. It was awesome. I was like, who are these bulls? You know, why, and why are they on parades? <laughs> and um, I don't know where I was going with that. Just this the, now I was, I literally just started picturing bulls like going in a parade with candy. See, I get, I, my, 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 that, my, that's why, my, that's why a comedian shouldn't run the country. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but yeah, that was a huge backdrop of the 90s. And we talked it about in our episode on Laurel Canyon, which I would encourage anyone to listen to who hasn't about how how much politics and the military in, was influencing art in the 60s directly. Right. Um, and so, yeah, it's like, again, David, the bands that had influenced you, this is some of the stuff that they were singing about, you know? Yeah. And I, I kind of dove into that. Um, a little caveat would be it's just to someone that's really fascinated with the pre-Islamic, uh, we call it the Middle East. It's not in the middle of anything. It's not East. It's only East of us, but 
that culture, it's just, it's just a really sad state of affairs when you have museums and ain't, this is ancient history, you know, thousands of years before we talked about ancient Rome. This is way before that. And it's such a strong culture and it, it kind of turns your stomach when you see those Assyrian Lamassu statues being destroyed and it's never going to come back. And then you have to remind yourself, this is what Alexander did. And we revere him like yeah. he's Christ. And this is what we're told people in the world today want. Like, all we hear is how Russians want to use iPhones and see American movies and wear Adidas and they're against Putin's war and he's an oppressor and we're coming to the rescue. Well, we've came to the rescue a lot and I don't know if we do the best job at, at coming to the rescue. I don't know, man. Like Russia, both Russia and China just seem like countries you don't like like the United States that you don't want to mess with. I mean, number one, they got Siberia. We don't know what's going up on in there in the snow and the mountains where no one wants to go. I'm sure they got some weird shit underground and <laughs> all sorts of experimentations. Well, we can get back to the music thing, but the thing that I don't necessarily love talking about, you know, current events are okay, but when you talk about something like the Ukraine war or whatever, everyone want, just wants to argue with you because we're kind right. of in the current fog right now. Yeah. But we can take things that have happened already and get a better grasp on some of the older stuff like we're talking about in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Yeah, I love that. We can kind of make the point so you get an awareness uh, to try to get some sort of critical thinking instead of making current political arguments. I, I kind of find it the best way to think about it would be imagine the tobacco industry, right? You know, 70, 50, 60, 70 years ago, they rolled out this tobacco cigarette and they, they sold it as healthy and, and made you lose weight and all these other, you know, media propagandizing tactics that they said. And everyone believed this. And we laugh at that now because we're so cool and we're so smart and we have this hindsight. But people believe that and they were there was rallying against the industry, but the people that were against this industry were called conspiracy theorists and quacks. And then decades later, we take for granted what now seems like common sense, but millions of people died and billions of dollars were made. You know, the war in Iraq when George Bush lied and said that there was weapon, weapons of mass destruction, him and Tony Blair knew that didn't exist. Yeah. No and kind of Bush, Bush had the right personality at the time for that, you know, because he was just like, ah, yeah, I'm like a fun guy. You know, they'd always say a guy you'd want to have a beer with. And so it was like <laughs> it, it never came across as sinister when he was like talking about it as if someone without that type of personality. Yeah, where it would be like, man, this guy, you know, seems intense. Yeah, I, I think the same way. And they did the same thing with Obama. They, you know, the guy that you want to have a beer with, they, whenever anyone talks about Obama, they say he's such a well-spoken, well-composed president. It's like, well, yeah, but he's bombing Syria. So what do you, what do you but care? But he's doing it with such composure. Right. Yeah. He's, he's doing it with such grace and finesse. Yeah, it's it, the, with the tobacco analogy. It's, it's, it kind of helps you to look at the current long cons or the grifts that are being ran right now because you know this is the reason why documents are sealed for 75 years it doesn't matter if you know 50 60 70 years later if we find out the truth and we're against it like who would argue today that tobacco is harmful no one would argue but you know people made a lot of money at that that 20 year war trillions we spent trillions on that so we can look back to these distant things and see that these grifts were happening. They did happen. They're still happening. They didn't know the grifters didn't give up grifting. And you just kind of want to think what's happening right now that, that I'm not really aware of. That's, that's kind of when I came across this, the idea of neoliberalism, which is disaster capitalism or Eisenhower's military industrial complex speech people refer to it as a bunch of different names but 
it's where, you know, capitalistic financial corporations take advantage of a shaken up population. Sometimes it's a population we shake up ourselves, including our own, to impose reforms where big corporations win, little people never win. And we've had we've had some domestically as well. So these aren't just people playing around making the world their monopoly board, although that is what they do. But it could be natural disasters as well. It's described as floods, wars, terrorist attacks, these things that shake up a current state of affairs. And when a population is disoriented and reeling and, and affected, that's when it's the best time to take opportunities. So currently, BlackRock uh, has signed a humongous contract to rebuild the Ukraine. Their Ukraine has not even been destroyed yet. And regardless of your opinion on the war, BlackRock's construction project seems weird. And people say, well, why do you care? Well, I care to some degree because, because they're it doing it with our money. Right. They're not rebuilding the corrupt Eastern European nation out of the goodness of their hearts. We are funding it. We always fund it. And but then guess what? It never gets rebuilt. And you can see that when you go to these other places that we're talking about, whether it be Iraq, whether it be Chile, Argentina, or ask the people about New Orleans, how that went down for them. Ask what they yeah, got. Ask, ask Brad Pitt in his shit box homes that he was building down there. Remember that whole thing? Yeah. And you kind of, you know, it's good that people want to help. And I think more times than not, people want to look like they want to help or be yeah. perceived is helping you know what you know what uh to interject with um you know like you were saying with taking a break from things that are so heavy but i dislike sean penn so much i've never even i remember when that new orleans thing was happening and he went on larry king and he was like i had to go down there and save people and he brought his own photographer like Great admitted God. to it and then and then showed pictures of him like helping people into a boat uh right. like saving new orleans and i was like this is the biggest douchebag he's on par i don't know it's for me it's a it's a contest between jared leto and uh and sean penn it's really sad but... unless you like jared leto <laughs> of I I didn't. he's a capricorn do you like his music or his movies just put the disclaimer that i love everyone the left and the right uh, are both evil demons and for that i love them both equally and <laughs> of course i love an industry that is built on narcissism and self-deception so much so that you believe you have to go down there and save the world like sean penn we had the same thing happen here in flint where you know we had the poisonous water by the by the great tricky governor rick and um Jaden Smith came here on a private jet, dropped off a few cardboard boxes that filtered out water. Oh, and, um, and that was there a big photo op? Of course there was. We oh, have, yeah. we actually didn't even use them. We have, we have them on display in, in a shitty Institute, but you know, it's nothing against him because he's a young kid and he's trying to help. You forget the idea that he flew on a, on a, on well, a, and then not only that, but he was sponsored by that water company. He, he was, was already, yeah, he was like, uh, you know, like showing it off an in Instagram post or whatever. It was well, like, yeah. all that stuff aside, I'm just thinking, you know, it's the Sean Penn syndrome. Do you not think we know what water filters are, man? <laughs> <laughs> Where do you think, you know, our, our city's not much and it's not the greatest place in the world, but. Are these some sort of filters what? that filter out pure poison? Yeah, where do you it, it, think it, we're living? How do you think we're living, man? To where <laughs> you're right, it actually comes off as super offensive to you guys living in Flint. Like, if you, you really put it in hindsight, no, this is what he thought was going to happen. He thought you guys were going to come up like that's and like point. poking the filter and like, <laughs> <laughs> and then we club it to death, right? Yeah, yeah. Yo, you just <laughs> shoot it, dude. It's just you guys all pull out your guns, yeah, and shoot you the shit out of the it. You're shooting it. That's exactly how I feel about all this uh celebrity syndrome about <laughs> about the about 
all of this and just to be selfish for a minute and talk about the the water scandal when i believe i've said this before but when the rappers and the celebrities were sending semi trucks full of water it's not up to us to fix these problems we didn't create it, it's cool and it's appreciated. It's, I, I think it's out of the goodness of their heart. Although when you bring in a photographer for a photo op, not really. And when you fly, and then go on Larry King and just uh, and talk basically about talk about yourself the whole time and how much what you did. Yeah. yeah. It's a little bit sad because you're kind of so self-obsessed. You can't see that. For example, a city knows how to filter water. You can't see that, but you know, I just try to take a different path and, and, just try to think about it. And it seems like most of the time, this wanting to help or this wanting to be good or virtuous is actually super condescending and, and kind of undermines a people as a whole, you know? So. Yeah. By the way, you guys did, you guys did stuff for, for it. Um, just so if anybody's like, well, at least they tried to help. I mean, David, you did stuff too. And I'm, I'm sure there's stuff you probably haven't yeah. even gone public with, but most of the things I do, uh, I don't go public with because I don't like living in the public. I'm, I know it sounds pathetic and sad, but this town that I live in, I love, and there's not a lot of people in it. And it's not the best place, but I kind of just like to hang out with my friends and my chick and have a simple life. I don't want to be an intellectual or be a, a leader or a hero or anything. I don't want to get out there in front of people and and tell them what they need to do or what they need to think. I don't want to fly my private jet into town and drop off some cardboard boxes. I don't. I, I'm curious about all these things, but that's that's not really where my heart is at. I'm kind of a shitty creative person, you know? So like I said at the beginning, talking about these things, I don't love doing this. It's, yeah. It kills me. It kill, it, and I know that sounds like corny and pathetic, and I don't necessarily look like being... But killed. I'm on... Dude, I, I'm on the same page with you you know uh one of the reasons why we started this podcast is i was just out in la doing some shows and you know they're like my comedian friends are like you got to have a podcast that's just what it is now it's like if you're going to be a comedian it's just part of the package you got to do it and i'm like ah because i didn't you know like yeah. I, I number one i hate having to do something that everyone's doing i like to come up with new innovative things and stuff like that and um, the other day, putting together um, our next episode that will drop on Norwegian black metal, I was actually thinking about you like when I was going through it. And I appreciate like the fact because, you know, growing up pre internet and all that, all of the rock stars and music that I listened to, they, the artists were mysterious. There was, there was a mystique. You didn't know much about them. You couldn't find all the information. And they most certainly weren't like, like mailing out newsletters saying like where they went to lunch and shit, you know? So like looking yeah. up some stuff that I was looking to find on you, I was like, man, like Dave's got, and not that it was intentional. Like this is just how you're wired in your personality, but you're just not throwing yourself out there at every little thing. Like there's still, a mystique about you and some mystery. And it's mainly because you're not a narcissistic maniac that, you know, like a lot of these other people will, that has to, wants everyone to know about their whereabouts and what they're doing at every single time. I, like you are just a creative and this is something you enjoy. And then the thing, the double-edged sword is putting up with all the shit of being in the public eye. Yeah. Something that I've struggled with since the beginning, actually not, to make it about me, we got to stay on top of Kissinger, but it is <laughs> something because when people come up to you in public and tell you how you changed their life, you start thinking, ah, maybe it'd be better if I could change more people's lives, maybe the most people's lives, not in the way that, you know, I'm not going to carpet bomb Cambodia, but you know, you, if someone tells you you've done something good, you want to do more good. If that makes yeah. any sense. Yeah does mean and, and things are corny you know like 
podcasting or or creating content or whatever. I don't I don't want to be a content creator. I want to just be a person. And that sounds pretty lame because you know, these days it's all about those, you know, see those YouTube videos that have that inspirational, motivational, inspiring symphonic music and someone's like working out and sweating and there's yeah. You know, they have quotes like, luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity, right? Yeah. Supposed to inspire you to start a business or get a shape, get in shape or like land a new job and, and stuff like that. But sometimes if you're pessimistic in the head, like me, luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity could also mean privatizing a communist country, which is a billion dollar industry. You know, <laughs> you have we have an office of reconstruction and stabilization. That's what it's called, reconstruction and stabilization. It's in the State Department of our government. And the job of this office, it's a branch, and it's to draw up reconstruction plans for countries just in case they become a target of a U.S. destruction plan. And yeah, when you know things like that, you're kind of just like... What's the point? Why am I creating anything? You know, yeah. I get it. Yeah. But not to not to be a downer, but you know, just to to get back into what we were talking about. It's it's kind of hard and the world is a a weird place full of strange things and don't always know where to go with it, right? Yeah, yeah. You gotta, well, you know. There's just always like the business as aspect of it and the business yeah. aspect of, you know, being a creative now is producing content and stuff like that. I mean, personally, I miss the days of, you know, when I first started stand up and to get into a comedy club, I was mailing out VHS tapes. Same. Yeah, yeah. I like I liked that. Um, you know, I was going to say what what, the, what I think is good about us talking about this that I hope people understand is that none of us are coming at this as a Democrat or a Republican. We're just trying to say we need to be able to call a spade a spade or a strike a strike, right? You know, we need to be able to call that. And when things happen, like one country invades another, it's very easy to get excited. And my philosophy on life has essentially started to become, I'll wait for the book to come out. And what I mean by that is, um, for instance, there's a book by Dave Cullen about Columbine. And if you read that book, it will change what you think you know about that, you know, event. And I've started to realize that it just takes time to truly understand this. And, you know, we'll have the, the book club, uh, the reference that we had of uh, that we're going to do the book club for amusing ourselves to death. One of the things that he talks about in there is that since the uh, telegram We've been getting inundated with useless information that does not impact our life. And so why this conversation is interesting to me is for a few things. For one, how much do we need to care? Um, I do think that there is a level, like you said, where it does matter because our money and funds are going to it. I have family and friends in the military, right? Um, and then also, I, I think a lot about artists talking about current events because usually i hear the absolute worst takes it's like two sides of the coin either they have the absolute worst take right or left or their system of a down and rage against the machine who are singing about stuff that nobody understands like nobody knows that he's talking about the you know our armenian genocide or whatever they're just like oh that's a cool song or same thing with bulls on parade or, or whatever you know yeah. and uh, i think about I think about that a lot about, um, you know, every, is everyone entitled to an opinion? And, um, I don't know, you spend all this time building a platform and you now have access to people who want to hear from you. So it's like, who are you to not, to not use that? You know, we don't build platforms for no reason. There's self-interest involved in it, obviously. Right. Yeah. Just to, to some degree, I, I think so. And I think that also just to your point that we're not coming as Democrats or Republicans, it would be yeah, a lot easier if we were. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting, um, you know, something that um, with doing stand-up comedy is, and especially like if you put stuff on the internet, 
now I'm, I'm apolitical basically. Like I've just, I don't, I don't want any involvement in it. I don't, I don't really care at all. Um, obviously there's some issues that I care about, but, uh, when I make fun of Democrats, then I have everyone like calling me a Republican. Like I'll meet people and be like, aren't you like a crazy, like, you know, you're pretty Republican. Right. And I'm like, no, I'm just making fun of shit that I think needs to be made fun of. And that's funny. And then when I make fun of Republicans, people are like, oh, he's a Democrat. And I've come across that. It's like, no, I'm just, I'm basically on the outside. Like George Carlin said, like, you know, the world is a freak show and I got a front row ticket to it, basically paraphrasing it. Yeah. And so it's super frustrating that um, you can't put, uh, you know, your thoughts out there without being uh, pinpointed as something that you're not, if it aligns up with the current agenda of a political party. Yeah, it's frustrating, number one, because the viewpoints change as we see with time. So uh, your affiliations fluctuate completely independently from your own doing. But number two, it's frustrating because if we wanted to be, um, you know, a left leaning Democratic Party shill, we could get the open arm support of a bunch of people and be and become a lot more popular of in the in our respective communities doing so. And it's the same the other way. If we wanted to become the anti-establishment Republican types, those people are very, very prone to lifting up like voices uh, as well. And we would be a hundred times more successful too. So it only damns us being this way. You know, like, <laughs> dude, dude, trust me, I have, <laughs> I have experienced it when so people, many times. They try to catch you on a trip up, like, um, you know, you were at January sixth, and you know, you, I know you're a, a Republican or whatever, and and you're kind of like, if I were a Republican, I would be doing all the Republican shows, and I'd probably have a lot of money. Yeah, and you would have definitely been inside the Capitol as the Buffalo Man or whatever. I right. could see, you know, they like if you that, they would love, they would, they love, would to, love it. They would love to have me, you know, because I, I was standing right there, and uh, you know, I'm kind of an alternative guy, a rock singer, whatever. But I'm, you know, believe in this or believe in that. But I don't do that because I'm not that. Right. And I, I noticed we kind of touched on it last time where. People don't care what you are there. It's just as long as you agree with them, you know, RFK is running for president right now and getting the hell censored out of him. And he's an accomplished attorney that is a Kennedy, a, dem a democratic institution in this country. Right. And we even have problems with him. <laughs> I'm just a rocker. If they have problems with an attorney that did 80 years of environmental work if for, you know, and is democratic royalty. What type of issues are they going to have for a shitty rocker like me? By the way, will you are you willing to talk about because um, people got mad for you even being there and you had just said, hey, of course, I'm there. I am. Uh, I'm, I'm in a band and I'm trying to record a music video. And that was kind of I don't I'm sure you're still kind of doing this, but there was a period of time where when you were you were like the Hemingway video and, and you're doing all these videos all over the world at, at different places. And it was like, you wanted to be where there were big events where interesting things were happening. You were trying to be there. So your fans knew that about you. Are you willing to touch on why you never released that footage? Cause um, we talked about it once and I thought it was funny. Yeah. I felt like I called my shot. I, I don't, I, I thought it would be a better move to say I was there doing a music video and then never release it so it would look like i was a liar and creating confusion and causing more chaos <laughs> i kind of also felt lame because it's not something i typically do I, is uh hey i'm doing this and here's my reason or my explanation or my defense or my justification yeah i i don't really care if people don't want to be fans because i am where i go where i go places in the world they might not agree you know, the, the day before I was on a beach in Brazil um, at a 300,000 person party during COVID, I nice. flew home. My friend picked me up from the airport, said, we're going to DC to save the world. I'm thinking, oh, I'd, I'd like to save the world. 
<laughs> I had no idea this, this, the honest truth is I had, I had really no idea the details, but you now my friend says we're going and I'm going to go. I'm like, he's like, there's, this shit is going to be crazy. You're going to want to bring your camera. I already had my camera cause I was in Brazil for a few weeks in, in December. And so for my birthday, for new years and all this other stuff, I flew right back. I'm on, I'm on the front steps there. I'm on CNN and my, my girl who is English, she lives in London. She's like, yo, you're on the CNN or whatever. <laughs> oh, really? I did not know. Family that. does. Family's getting, uh, you know, meeting you prematurely. <laughs> and I kind of. Is that your boy David over there? <laughs> and, and I've. After people have all these concerns, I'm like, well, you don't have to worry about me. I'm a whacked out moron, like I always have claimed to be. I've never claimed to be a beacon of morality or genius. So, yeah, I was here doing this thing. I, I find it strange that people uh, hide or might be ashamed of that fact. But I had a cool idea for the song called 2a that is on the last record the one before this last one that i yeah. think you probably know that was going to be the video so it's going to be pretty cool kind of like rob zombie big american flags flamethrowers me and my shitty white trash buddy craig he has a flamethrower and um we were That's just awesome gonna, was it a real flamethrower yeah yeah really nice so, so we were going to have this this cool video and i had a bunch of uh, videos of zip ties and people getting smoked and tear gassed and all these things on on my phone i lost my phone in like a some type of skirmish it kind of kind of got, got hit on my hand in the crowd was shuffling and all these things but i had all these all these videos and honestly i was it's kind of played out like uh this person got caught at the at the thing i wasn't caught i was I was posting pictures when I was there, but none of them would post or load. There was such a, maybe just so many people or maybe right. the service, or maybe I didn't pay my phone bill. I don't know. I have Verizon. So they're also known to do a little bit of disaster capitalism sponsoring. <laughs> yeah, um, I have Verizon too, but anyway. <laughs> so my, my stuff wouldn't post. So I'm posting people getting arrested. I'm posting fights between people. I'm posting all this stuff. And, and, you know, I'm not, that thirsty i'm not one of those people that kind of goes through their phone it's like i haven't posted in a while let me post something that's two years old so i can remain relevant yeah. i don't i don't do that i kind of don't care so on the ride home um you know i just kind of didn't have a phone and didn't really hurry to get one because uh, so people probably thought that you were disappeared or something it, it only made it worse yeah and then and then when they they said all these things about me. I don't know why I defended myself because I, I don't really shouldn't really do that. But that was the funniest thing you did. You started it off with dear internet cucks. Like I read that and was instantly like, ah, like that was the funniest response I've ever heard. And I agree. I'm with you. I'm a big, I'm not going to explain myself to anybody, but I, I thought that what you said was funny and cool. So what, <laughs> what did you say? Cause I didn't, I haven't read it. Um, they basically, well, they kind of pinned it out like they had caught me doing something that I shouldn't be doing that they didn't approve of. I kind of, I had a bunch of messages calling me racist and everything, all of the common tropes that they, that they yeah. still, that they know and love. And so I, I just did a public post saying, you know, I'm not any of these things. This is what I was doing. But then I thought to myself, well, now I've already told them what I was doing. It's not really that cool to me anymore. It doesn't excite me. It doesn't get my artistic spirit flowing. Like, I don't feel good about it. People aren't going to be like, oh, wow, look at this. Um, he has footage from January 6th that he recorded in his music video. So it lost its... It's, um, it lost its appeal to you. You're like, this has yeah, been. Me. I didn't have the drive that I had before. And also I was feeling, I know this sounds funny to say, because I try to be strong and courageous, although this, this does not require strength or courage, but I've had a few music videos get taken down that have millions of views. And I, I know it sounds 
corny to say, but I spend a lot of money on them. Right. And they're not cheap. And I know that's my own fault. And I just don't like really focusing on my time and energy. I spend, you know, a month of work and creating these things that I get excited about and going these places in the world and documenting this stuff that I think is important or cool or inspiring. And it just gets demonetized, taken down, and my and my YouTube gets a strike. Yeah, it's like very frustrating too, because I got to be careful with like jokes that you know that I put up. Same way. I mean, my first video I ever, when TikTok was first coming up, I was like, "Oh, this is great!" I put together something about I just fun, just stupid, and it was going, I guess, viral. It was up to almost uh, it was on its way to like three hundred thousand followers and less than like or 300,000 views in less than, um, eight hours. And, you know, I already had 500 followers and then I, uh, it got taken down and then my account banned for bullying. Yeah. Bullying. And I'm like, this is, that was the first and ever. And so I didn't, wasn't it like I never a Hillary Clinton one. joke too? No, it, what it was, was people that have a lot of followers because they're women in yoga pants that are saying that they're yoga moves, but they're really just spread eagle in front of a camera. <laughs> I just think is like ridiculous. So I took a bunch of those photos and I animated them farting with fart sounds and then the little <laughs> smoke coming out. And people were like, thought it was the funniest thing ever, like all over. And people flagged it, I'm sure the women for bullying and said I was bullying by making these women fart. And I tried to appeal it and they were like, no. And I was like, fuck TikTok. I'm never using this again. Dude, David's face when you were like, uh, I animated them farting. He was kind of like, mm, okay. <laughs> like, I just thought it was, it made me laugh. Like I did. Dude, that's the I, dumbest made, reason to get banned. Yeah, I know. Can you even imagine? So then you want to do something a bit, little bit more risque. Yeah. And it's like, what's the point? Like, like you said, if you put all this and I didn't put any energy in be, uh, behind that, but with uh, writing live shows, videos editing forces. you know creative forces are it's it's spirit and energy that you have and it's finite you know you did put something into it yeah yeah well, that is that is true but just not as much as um i guess my point was like worrying about like you said like bigger projects or something that's more time consuming and then just to have it struck and then taken down yeah i try to make it kind of something I already am doing. Like when I went to Spain, do the running with the bulls and stuff, I was going to do that either way. It's something I've always wanted to do. I just, uh, it's something I'm interested in. And, and it was uh, just a calling that I had to go and see for myself. I don't, I don't like engaging with into the politics of it, uh, with, without at least experiencing it to some degree. And I was going to go do that anyway, but you capture something and it, it kind of, gets just gets taken down and it's a little disheartening but i always have the experience i just kind of try to share the experience and that's where you know the powers that be come into play i have a question yeah. about that but real quick i do want to say i'm really bummed out that it was going to be for the 2a video because um i really love that song and how you know david says things like power bad not the power i have what does that mean well, if you're in America and you say, I don't like power, but it's like, well, how much power do you have compared to somebody who has a boot on their neck in another government or somebody who lives in the country where all he can do all day is just find water and food? And that's his day. He has no career. He has no voice. He has no vote. You know, same thing with the line about money. It's like, um, you know, money bad or being rich is bad. And it's like, well, you are rich compared to you know, you can be poor in America, but be very rich in the world. So I, I like that it's, it's um, you know, how he, how he had framed that. So I'm bummed out that that was the video that, uh, so I had asked, I asked David, I'm like, well, how come you never did put out that January 6th thing? And he's like, yeah, because people expected it. So I just put something out demonic instead. <laughs> it's just like, he's like, yeah, I'm not going to, because then people were literally like, show us the video then, David. And I like right. that you're like, no, you don't deserve it. <laughs> Uh, you don't <laughs> you don't deserve my masterpiece creations uh, yeah so like <laughs> just on a uh, as a question and i if i asked this to other people i feel like they wouldn't quite get the question but i feel like you will have a would have a feel for it what did it feel like on january 6th did it feel demonic 
or did it just feel like not did it just feel like a normal thing of a group of people pissed off or did you feel like there was like a powerful demonic energy flowing through what what was the spirit of january 6th being there boots on the ground well as the kids say it was a vibe <laughs> <laughs> it didn't feel demonic no um i'm always just an ob- kind of a objective observer i guess on the outside looking around checking everything out one thing it it did teach me uh, which i i kind of already known this because i went to rallies riots all these things before uh this wasn't my first one i the reason why i feel maybe the way i feel or why i have the views that i have is because i was there and being there is you know only one perspective i understand that even as you said earlier about waiting till the book comes out right yeah. That's perspective. But, you know, the further we get away from a, an event, the more we lose, you know. So the hindsight's not always the best perspective. It's a perspective, but being there isn't either. I'm not claiming some authority because I was there. Yeah. But the one takeaway I had from it was the way that I perceived an event and the way that it was covered by the media how I perceived the event was more like the coverage we're now getting um, from say like the 4,800 hours of video footage that Tucker Carlson released some of. I've seen with my own eyes, police letting people into the building. No one was going to tell me that this was a deadly insurrection because the only person that died was a insurrectionist there were a bunch of fake stories about how other people died or or whatever it might have been but it isn't really what i saw and an insurrection is an armed overthrowing of the government this was the only unarmed insurrection in the history of the world and it was (laughs) i i so i I'm just observing, basically, you know, that's what I go there to do. I didn't go there to participate. I didn't go there to, you know, preach my views. I just, I watched, but again, in a long-winded way, it's always so strange seeing something happen and then seeing the coverage of it. Oh, yeah. You know, because again, I, I seen those people, they were led inside. There was no violent overthrowing of it. They They walked right through the doors. Now, there was a SWAT team uh, type of, you know, vans came and those people were deployed. And that those are the clips that they show on, on CNN. They show the clips of the people yeah. uh, in the riot gear going into the Capitol yeah. and throwing everyone out. I bet Sean Penn was in that team. I think he was <laughs> on the team, yeah. Yeah, and, he was like... And it makes it makes for good TV and it makes everyone get oh, yeah. their feelings crazy. They think the world's ending and all this other stuff. And again, I don't have any opinion about it, but they cleared that. You're, you're like, it was so crazy. I lost my phone. Yeah. What else happened? People died. I, I just right. my phone. Hey, what about my ways? phone? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, they, they show the clip of the, the SWAT team clearing the house, which took maybe two minutes. Right. It, yeah. I, I don't know how long it took, but it was very quick before they had the whole, they had a perimeter pushed out for blocks. And, but, but when you show that footage and you don't show the, the hours of the other things that you saw happening. And also there, there was, a, you know, a lot of people there that they didn't show that on TV. I have a picture from a helicopter from, from the day that was just crazy. And, you always just get this crazy feeling when you're around that many people, Uh, just like a show or just like anywhere else. It's, it's kind of a thing that you go and same as a celebration in Spain, you know, these are tens and thousands or hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people that you get together. You just get this feeling. And I didn't get any type of evil or positive vibe. I, I, I didn't. You you were just, you're probably like, man, the party in Brazil was way better. (laughs) <laughs> I have to say it, it it was I hate to I hate to say it you know but Brazil is another country that we we helped destroy 
You know what? I love my uh, I love the Michael Jackson video. They don't really care about us that he filmed him. All I want to say is that I, they don't really like, care about yeah. us. When I when he at the beginning of that video, he walks out of the door and he's like, yeah, <laughs> like he's like pissed. He's like, yeah. <laughs> like points at him and then he just grabs yeah. his dick and thrusts and then everybody's beating the drums and i'm like this is my favorite i watch it like i, I watch it all the time dude that's no sh and i'm not even just saying this that's literally my favorite michael jackson video when i was a kid dude oh. I, I saw the same thing and was the like drums dude, hell, in the yeah. at one time he's dancing so hard he collapses <laughs> and they have to pick him up yeah it's unbelievable how I come just, you didn't do that david you should have been doing that at january 6th well i'm still <laughs> trying to figure out how to dance and do my certain moves <laughs> Yeah, I tell you, I'd play one of the drums for you, but I can't hold a beat at all. You would be like, is this what is, is this wrong real? with this man? <laughs> Avant garde. But yeah, so the, the just to summarize it up. If I would have made a music video, it would have been demonetized and taken down and my channel would have got another strike. And then, you know, uh, it's, it's not the end of the world. And I don't. And then they probably would have been like, he filmed a video. He is the leader of the insurrection. Well, yeah, but also we have to be honest, like we have, there are things established that are vessels that we have to use. We don't have like a, you know, MTV. Now we do have more resources than, than, than in the past. Right. You know, we do, we don't just, we're not just reliant on the gatekeeper of let's say MTV, but uh, you do kind of have to cater to, to YouTube's rules. You know, if you, if you want to make a living, you know, and if people want to see, uh, David continue to make music, then they have to understand that, you know, there's, they, you, you, you make music by making money because Dude, equipment should, is expensive and hey, studio time is not cheap. I just got, you know, make, make the music video you have planned, but then just sell it on VHS. And then you'll have a bunch of like young kids having to go to Goodwills to find VCRs. <laughs> They'll be like, where is, where are these VCRs located? Yeah, that's not a bad idea. And just to be clear, um, you got to choose your battles. I'm not saying that losing for obvious, I'm never going to tuck my tail between my legs or not show courage and in, in issues that I think are important or be outspoken about things I believe in. But just to go back to my political standings, I guess that is to say, I, I didn't believe in it. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't motivated. I wasn't like, yeah, I'm going to go show the world that, you know, um, it, it's driving force was not that powerful in me. Uh, if, there, if you're speaking about something I care about or, or anything, I'm perfectly fine with getting my channels taken down or my means of income or whatever it might be. I, it's pretty clear. I'm not really doing this to make a living or money. I would have, I would have just went and became an engineer um, if I wanted to do that. So I'm not saying to not be courageous or, you know, to kowtow to the technocrat overlords. I'm just saying I kind of just go with my feeling, you know, at the time yeah. maybe I was defeated, uh, not from that, but maybe I was just in a bad mood, you know, <laughs> I don't, yeah. there's no, there's no real science behind it. I could just, could have just done it because I, I just stopped caring I uh, yeah. you know, it could be, could have been. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I fully understand what you're saying just based on myself. Like you get excited for a project if time, too much time goes by or you get, you know, any kind of input from like externally of any kind, you could be like, I just, I'm not going to do that. Like I'm on to the next thing. Yeah. That was a moment of time. It, you know, and now that time has passed and you would actually, if you did it, you'd have to force it. And then no, like, why would you want to force putting something together? You know, it's got to be, it's got to be fun. You got to be like excited to get the finished product. Yeah. You need to have that driving divine energy force. This, behind you. And you got to watch all the YouTube videos in the morning with the music and the inspired. And the, yeah. Pick yourself up by your bootstraps. You can do it. Work 60 hours without sleep. That's how you get to the top. You're a pussy. You sleep. You're a pussy. Exactly. And that is really what the mentality that the sociopathic mentality that leads us today just to drop back into our. Yeah. The, the original uh, point, way that we were going and we really digressed and this is a fantastic conversation but you said you could 
hop on with us next week. So I think maybe we make this a two part and then we pick up. And I know we really didn't get uh, really didn't get that deep into the Kissinger thing like we were planning. So let's just do a part two if you're cool with that next week, David. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. All right. Well, let's do that. Yeah. How, how people can support us without spending money is just the digital support right now. That is an actual currency. Likes and subscribes, unfortunately, are uh, will lead to, to real currency. So again, as I said at the beginning of it, uh, please like and subscribe. That helps us out more than you can believe. This stuff is all, when I started this, I, w- I told myself we were going to do no BS when it came to purchasing views and likes and all that. I can do all of those things. I can go buy the Instagram likes. Do not get me wrong. I can have 10,000 followers tomorrow, but I wanted to keep all of this organic. So when you see our followers, those are real followers and I want to keep it that way. So if you guys, that's how you can support us is follow us on the platforms and subscribe. And and I hate it. Like I did not want to be one of those, uh, you know, podcasts where like subscribe, subscribe, but then you, you have to be. So now I'm just accepting that I'm the sham. Wow. (laughs) We, We will be the sham. Wow. Of, uh, Oh, sub- subscribe yeah check <laughs> just get real excited about david's it. got tour stuff coming up check out king10.com and that's it this is tool shed art club